All right, thanks, Ulysses. So, good morning. We've had a nice little chat here in the sanctuary where it is comfortably 70 degrees, I don't know, 68, 69 degrees. And greater than zero. It's greater than zero, that's right. <laughs> and uh, we are uh, here, and it's, a, I mean, as far as the, 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 the you know, weather goes, I mean, it's crystal clear blue skies. It's beautiful. Weather. In that sense, it's beautiful. It is just a little bit cold. So, but it's, it's good to be here nonetheless. So, and we made it through the cold, and here we are. So, um, we're going to continue through Hebrews. <clears throat> and I, as I was preparing, I want to do something a little bit different this morning. I'm going to read our key chapter through the Message Bible, which adds so much more dimension to it. So, but before we go any further, let us pray. Roger, would you pray for us? Sure. Father in heaven, we thank you for the cold. We thank you for mm. a crisp New England winter day that we have today. We pray for those who aren't here. We have a small group. Mm. We pray for those. We know that COVID is sweeping through a lot of families uh, mm. right now. So we pray for those who are sick at home, who couldn't be with us today. We pray for those who stayed home out of uh, precaution. And we pray for those who are here. We know that in spirit, we're all gathered together. So wherever we mm. are, online, at home, here, I pray for your presence and I pray for your enlightenment of our minds so that we can take, take into our hearts the wisdom that we find in the book of Hebrews. Mm. Be with me and the pastor now as we continue. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 So since I'm confident some of our Sabbath school members are probably viewing online. I just want to reiterate my phone number. If you want to call or text 978-833-4308. And forgive me if I, for some reason, maybe don't get to see it. And, um, um, but we're going to put it right there. Hopefully I will, won't miss it. But I wanted to get us started here to read Hebrews. And by the way, I have made the switch over to contacts, and that solves one problem for me, but creates another. So now I need reading glasses. With the contacts? With the contacts, because I am farsighted, or nearsighted, where I can see distance. So now, so that compensates for that. Yeah, I could, I could see near. At any rate, it's one or the other. So now I have these here. Just these are, are cheap ones from, from Walmart, but it is, uh, so it's a little bit different. So today, everything might be a little bit confusing for me. <laughs> but I want to read uh, Hebrews chapter 1 from the message. And it's, I'm, it, it will take about two minutes, so bear with me here. And now, of course, my readers are fogging up. But going through a long line of prophets... God has been addressing our ancestors in different ways for centuries. Recently, he spoke to us directly through his son. By his son, God created the world in the beginning, and it will, be, and it will all belong to the son at the end. The son perfectly mirrors God and is stamped with God's nature. He holds everything together by what he says, powerful words. After he finished the sacrifice for sins, the Son took his honored place high in the heavens right alongside God, far higher than any angel in rank and rule. Did God ever say to an angel, You're my son, today I celebrate you, or I'm his father, he's my son? When he presents his honored son to the world, he says, All angels must worship him. Regarding angels, he says, The messengers are winds, the servants are tongues of fire. But he says to the Son, your God, and on your throne, and on the throne for good, your rule makes everything right. You love it when things are right. You hate it when things are wrong. That is why God, your God, poured fragrant oil on your head, making you out as king far above your dear companions. Again to the sun, you, Master, started it all, laid the earth's foundations, then crafted the stars in the sky. 
earth and sky will wear out, but not you. They become threadbare like an old coat. You fold them up like a worn-out cloak. Lay them away on the shelf, but you'll stay the same year after year. You'll never fade. You'll never wear out. And did he ever say anything like this to an angel? Sit alongside me here on my throne until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet. Isn't it obvious that all angels are sent to help out with those lined up to receive salvation? When I read it in the message, it really sort of helped give a picture of this message of Hebrews, Hebrews chapter 1. And it is, oh, now I've got to go back to these. <laughs> it is an important book. Now, why, we, we talked about this last week, why is Hebrews important? Why study this book? Roger, now we get to pick your brain. Why is Hebrews important? Well, there's not just one reason. Um, and I, I, I didn't watch last week, so I don't know exactly what you guys concluded. We were in big heresy, so we... we oh, really? Oh, big cool. time. Oh, uh, man. It's yeah. always fun to push the envelope. <laughs> um, but, I mean, the obvious... I mean, it's right in the title, right? Yep. One reason is right in the title. It's the, it's the letter to the Hebrews. And so this book is written specifically to connect the identity and ministry of Jesus to the Old Testament. Yeah, right. It, the, the whole point is to connect the gospel, the New Testament, what we, I, you know, what we used to say in the 19th century, dispensation yeah. yep. to the Old Testament. That is probably the key, uh, the key point of the book of Hebrews. Yep. Um, other than that, I mean, just like any other book, there's a lot of discrete theological points yeah. you, could, you can, and we'll get to some of those, I think, yeah, in the will. lesson today, but I, I, would, I think that's probably the most important, is it shows continuity. I, I guess yeah. that would be the, the key word there. It's it, yeah. co continuity. It's not like God, you know, for a long time in, in American Protestantism, you have dispensational theology, yep. and, and they, they chop up the Bible <coughs> and, and, and to all these different time periods, yep. you know, and they, they make it seem like God changes his mind and, you know, he decided to deal with people this way for a couple of centuries and then he switched over to a different method. Yep. And, uh, you know, that's inaccurate in the whole totality of scripture because God doesn't change. Right. And, um, and then the second most important thing other than that continuity factor is what you just read. It's, um, I, specifically identifying the man Jesus Christ yeah. as Yahweh. Yeah. And I think that's a, a good thing to bring up. And I'm think, as you're saying this, I'm thinking, have we ever been in a situation where we needed to prove that Jesus is the Messiah? Like, let's say you have a friend who is of the Jewish faith, and he comes up to you, or she comes up to you and says, I've heard about this Jesus person. Um, and I know Christians think that he's the Messiah. How do you know he's the Messiah? And that's, I think that's a big question. And, and I'm, you know, when we look at, and, or someone who's Muslim, how do you know Jesus is the Messiah? How do you know this? And, and hopefully we have the wherewithal, the wisdom, and the knowledge of that moment to say, okay, here's, I'm glad you asked. And here's some text. And, and I think for me, you know, I believe it's Genesis 3.15, where, you know, the, we talk about that moment when God is spo speaking and the serpent will bruise the heel of the Messiah or, or the promised one, and, and the, the promised one will crush his head. And so we're seeing that, and then you've, in Psalms, and there's many other, in Micah, there's other prophecies. Hebrews is almost, and I, uh, is written, I think, largely to Jews who have accepted Christ. And it's sort of, a, like you mentioned, it's a reaffirmation that you have made the right choice. And, and it's interesting because human nature is like that. We sometimes can have buyer's remorse. 
And we say, ooh, did I make the right choice? Did I make the right choice? And Paul writes this letter to say, yes, you did. <clears throat> and I think it's important to think that it's Paul, or realize it's Paul, because what a guy. And there he's on the road to Damascus, and, you know, he gets struck blind, and, and it's, it's like this profound moment, and he's led to the people he was persecuting. And it's like, wow, this is, this, who could, this is, this is a God, this is a God moment. And so Paul says, look, don't, don't lose faith. This is the one, this is the one. So, and it seems as if, you know, this issue of angels is kind of interesting. Does anybody here remember the big angels craze? It was, I think, in the 90s. And it all started with a TV show. You remember Touched by an Angel? And then angels this, angels that. Books, trinkets, everything. Angels, angels, angels. And, and it was kind of moved on beyond that. But, but there was a lot of that going on. Mm -hmm. And it's almost as if Paul's addressing some issue here that uh, has come up for the believers. But... Um, let's take a look here at Numbers, uh, Numbers chapter, can somebody read Numbers 24, 14 through 19, and then can we have a volunteer to read Isaiah 2, 2 and 3. So we need a volunteer to read Numbers 14, I know what I can do, there we go, that might help, 14 through 19 of Numbers 24 and Isaiah chapter 2, verses 2 and 3. Any volunteers? Mandy? Fantastic. Are oh, you going to do Isaiah, Mary? Thank you. So Mandy, Mandy and Mary. M&M. <laughs> Love those candies. Yes. This is pretty amazing. Here we are seeing the fulfillment of these. Mary, can you read Isaiah uh, chapter 2? Yep. Isaiah 2 2. And it came to pass in the last days that the mountains of the Lord's house shall be established in the top of the mountain and shall be exalted above the hills, and all nations shall flow unto it. Thank you, Mary. Also, we do have a... Is this the Spanish class, Ulysses? Okay, so you turned off the auditorium? Okay, fantastic. So, so, all right. So why are these texts important? Why does our quarterly have us read these? I think it's to prove that God is almighty. And we as human beings, we take God's... We doesn't take God serious as he is. Yep. We treat God like if he's a human as we are. And we do not take God as a great creator that we have that amount of respect for him yeah. at all times. And I think this is what the text is saying. High and mighty and yep. mountains and mountains. I like that. That is... Do we ever really pause to th consider the glory, the grandeur of God? And that He has, He knows the end from the beginning. I mean, He, exactly, He started all this. Um, and that's something that, that has occurred to me. Imagine God is existing for all eternity. I mean, eternity is a long time, right? 
And one day he says, let us make man in our image. And it's like, wow. He chose. I mean, he could do anything, Roger. He could do anything. And he said, let us make man in our image. And he would give us that risky thing called freedom of choice. And it's kind of like, you ever wonder if he regretted that? Because he, he gives us freedom of choice. And the first thing, we know the story, but, but, but Adam, Eve made the wrong choice. And we're still dealing with the consequences today. But nonetheless, he still does this. I'm saying this, here's for, here, it's kind of like to use that example of one of the super ultra wealthy people, Bill Gates, the man who has everything, right? What do you give to him? What do you give to God? God has everything. And so what does he do? He says, there's something I'm looking for. I'm looking for people who will choose me. And there's that, that little aspect of God. It sort of just leaps off the page to me. It's like, wow, <clears throat> there's something that he wanted. And he wanted a relationship with people. I, would, I think want is the right word. Yeah. You can't say need. Oh, that's true, yeah. Because um, God is self-sufficient in and of himself. Right. In the traditional way of formulating the doctrine of yep. God. But he desires, I think, I, I mean, you, you go into a lot of different, you can go a lot of different directions with that. The ultimate answer to your question is, I think, uh, and this is kind of, well, it's, maybe it's not departing because the whole point of the lesson is God has spoken to us and through yep. his son. God exists in Trinity, right? Yep. It, for all eternity, God exists in relationship. Yes. So being in relationship is not something foreign to God. It's not like, right. I think sometimes we, we get this idea that you know, God was off somewhere in the Alpha Centauri region of outer space, just sitting there all by himself going, gee, I wish I had somebody to talk to. Yeah. I think I'll make, you know, because, yeah. it, you know, yeah, yeah Pantheon, uh, not Pantheon, but uh, uh, these, these hierarchies of angels, you know, oh, yeah. all these different, all these other beings that, that, that already exist, that do exist. But there was a very specific purpose. And I think that, that first part, a future avenging king is the way I summarized it when uh, I read it. Yeah. But that part is we're, we're, we were created, human beings were created to, we, and we misuse this term and don't, mis, don't misread what I'm saying, but human beings were created to exercise dominion and authority over the earth. Yep. I've said this, I don't know how many times in different settings, but we are image bearers. And in, in, in the context of the ancient Near East, yep. the image was the presence of the king. A conquered people would have, a, a king would conquer an area and he would put statues of himself yep. in that conquered area so that every time that conquered people looked at that statue, they would know that they were a conquered people and that their ultimate authority was that king, that conquering king. But we didn't conquer. God yep. created this for us. And then we messed it up big time. Yep. We abdicated our throne. Yep. And so what God, uh, Ty Gibson, uh, The Sonship of Christ is a great book because it kind of talks about this. The whole, the whole plan all along was to have human beings sitting on the throne, mm -hmm. right? Imaging God on earth and we screwed it up. So, but God, God, God's will always comes to, to fruition, right? So his plan ultimately winds up with a human being sitting on the throne of David, ruling over the earth. And that's where I think putting these two together, when you say, why does the lesson put these two together? That first part about a, a future avenging king, fast forward to the first century, second temple period, Roman empire, that's all most people saw. Yeah. That's what the zealots saw. Yeah. That's what they all saw in different ways. And they, 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 reacted to it in different ways, but they, they saw this future avenging period and they skip over the part where the whole world comes to Jerusalem for instruction and wisdom. Yeah. Right. So anybody can put, pick up a sword and rebel against the conqueror. But this other proof here, you talk about proof, like how can we, how do we prove what evidences do we give that Jesus fulfilled the conditions for being the Messiah? Yeah. You had a lot of pretenders yep. at that period. 
uh, documented in history. Any, like I said, anybody can pick up a sword and fight the Romans. Yeah. But then who's going to exercise judgment and justice from that throne in a way that's going to draw people out? You know, I, if I be lifted up, will draw all men unto yep. myself. Right? Only one person fulfilled that, that uh, condition. And that's a good point, and because that brings us to, you know, if there if there was an overthrow of a regime of some sort, what next? What do you set up? And that's where God's kingdom is the is really the only sustainable, long term, healthy uh, governor governorship, in the sense that He is a God of love, mm-hmm. and that's. What what comes eventually comes out in this lesson. So, um, I th- I like what you're sharing, Roger. And uh, any questions f- as we think about? This? And also, I just want you, the way you put that makes me think. Like again, historical co- historical context is, is 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 supremely important. Again, at this period in history, first century Roman Empire. You talk about any you know this regime change, and then what happens next? Well, they had already been through that. They had gone through a period where the, the, the throne was merged with the high priesthood. Yep. And the high priest was effectively uh, ruling as a king uh, from the temple. Yep. They had been through that period. Yeah, the theocracy. Um, yeah. They had been through the period of the, the rise of the Hasmoneans, yep. um, who weren't, oh, in, okay. in a technical sense, fully Jewish. They were yep. uh, Edomites, you know, yep. descendants of Esau. Uh, Herod, the, the Herod yep. family were, were Hasmoneans. And so they already had this sort of back and forth struggle over a legitimate Jewish king, uh, Israelite king, to sit on the throne. And it never panned out. And, that, yeah. and you just kept having this cycle of, well, we're going to rebel. And that, that's why you, had, you ended up with all these factions. You had the Pharisees, the Sadducees, uh, the Zealots. Um, and then within the Zealots, you had factions of ever-increasing extremism. You had the... Um, uh, the, the um, why can't I think of them right now? The Dead Sea Scroll community in oh. Qumran, oh, yeah. the Essenes, yep. who rejected it all, who said the high priest is invalid, the temple's invalid, the, <laughs> the, the throne's invalid, we're going to go out in the desert and we're just going to do our own thing. Um, and so that's what you wound up with. And instead of, again, the second part, instead of unifying people and drawing them all in to the same source, you know, I, is it not written that my house would be called a house of prayer for all nations? Instead of establishing that type of kingdom, you establish a human, a fully human kingdom, and you end up alienating people. And, and the, the, the key ingredient, the component we always fail to, to incorporate is human nature. That's where when you go through the list of the, the, the kings of, of Judah, and it's bad, 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 maybe a good king here, bad, bad, bad king, and it's just human nature. And even those good kings, essentially none of them were perfect. Oh no! I mean, who are the great kings? David, murderer, well, David, adulterer. Yeah. You know Solomon. Yeah, forget you know, it. All he wanted was power and yeah. more wives. And Re- Rehoboam, it just you know, yeah, it it's just, just disintegrates. And those are the good ones. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yep. And and it's it's like you know an Ahab you know you know Ahab it just goes. It gets weird. It gets and people and people. I mean, this is why um, Alan G. White actually was a, was a big fan of reading the intertestamental doc, documents. Uh, you know, uh, oh. first and second uh, Maccabees, Maccabees. Were, were, were one of the primary ones. And I encourage all of you to read those books. Get a find a Bible that has the Apocrypha, the Old Testament yep. Apocrypha in it, and read first and second Maccabees because the history that it illuminates. They're, they're not inspired scripture right but they are valid historical documents and they kind of illuminate they give you a lot of the background to jesus shows up on the scene and we just kind of have it in our minds yeah. like you know the romans are marching around and everybody's kind of whispering behind everybody else's back and the pharisees want one thing and the sadducees want the other thing and jesus and his 12 apostles want something else <laughs> and you don't really see the wider sort of geopolitical ideological context into which Jesus is speaking in which in, in which John the Baptist was speaking yeah and what made him so sort of revolutionary uh, in that period we, we lose that context and for for a Jew in the first century hearing all you know hearing what Jesus said in the context of 
everything else that was going on in society, um, it, it probably made sense in a very different way than. So when when yeah. when 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 you sit down to write a document like Hebrews to say, look, all the, the, all this fits together, all these puzzle pieces. There's a lot of puzzle pieces that we usually leave out in our Western Gentile way of yeah. thinking about it. Yeah. And it's interesting you said that because they all had different motivations. And as I see churches today, that's the same conundrum. You know, some churches, as I, as I look at it, the, our church was founded on this relentless pursuit of the truth. We want to know the truth. Today, and I don't mean to come across judgmental, but, but there's churches there into the, we know about the prosperity gospel. Mm-hmm. Oh, I'm going to go to this church. They're going to tell me warm, fuzzy things, how I can achieve my dreams and have a Cadillac. Mm -hmm. And then there's other churches that their focus is on fellowship. Oh, I'm going to go to this church because we're going to have a fun time and, and, or I'm going to this church because they have great music. And, and, uh, it was interesting. I just happened to catch an an episode of Blackish. I don't know if you've ever seen that TV show, Blackish. I've seen a couple episodes. I I don't have time to watch it. Yeah, I don't either. But this time I had time and it was interesting is, they go to church for the first time, and they're, they're going to church, and they say, hey, this wasn't so bad. The next Sunday, they go back to church, and they're bored, de- de- bored, they're just totally bored, because they were complaining that the guy, that the band up front only knows a few songs. And it's interesting, you know, okay, so that's how people, some of us, I mean, and maybe it's, that's, how people would do look at church from the outside. You know what I'm saying? They say, well, what is, you know, is this an entertainment program? And they see it and they're dancing. You know what I'm saying? It's, it's, but my point is, is, you know, why are we here? And that's where, that's a big question, not for us, but for society. Why church? Why this organization? And that's a really big question that, we have to answer and let the world know why we are here. So I agree. And that's, that's sort of segueing off of our, our lesson today. But it's, it's just interesting how you know, we have come to that point in our lives where we, we, we realize the basics, that we are created, there's a God, and that this is his word, and he's communicating to us through this word. And now we collectively come together to try to figure this out with humility, and hopefully no hidden agendas right. from ourselves and from others that we're just saying, what does God say? I don't think it's a, I don't think it's a departure from the lesson because we're talking about Hebrews and again, historical context, you're writing into this environment, you know, Hebrews, I don't remember the exact dating of it, but I think Paul was probably dead by, if we just assume yep. the, the tradition that Paul was the author and Paul was probably dead by 60, 65, I AD, think that's, that's, that's it. Right? Yep. So you're, you're at the beginning of the decline. You're, seeing, yep. you're starting to see these revolts, yep. Jewish revolt after Jewish revolt after Jewish revolt. And then 70 AD comes and the Romans are like, we're sick and tired of this. And they march into Jerusalem and they just ransack the place, destroy the temple. And so if you're a Jew and from 60 to say 120, which was the final big revolt, Masada yeah. and all that kind of stuff, um, so in that, that period, if you're a Jew in that, say, 60-year period, from 60 A.D. to 120 A.D., and you're like, wait a second. I, right here it says in Numbers chapter 24, avenging king. Yeah. They just destroyed the temple. Yeah. What's going on? And you're trying to make sense of things. You're going to sit down and you, you, you come, you know, some, maybe somebody you know says, hey, Read this, read this uh, document, or they mm-hmm. bring you maybe a lot of, the, it was a very illiterate society back then, but hey, come, come to this synagogue, this particular synagogue with me and listen to what yeah. the, the folks there have to say. And it's a, a believe it, it's a Christian synagogue. Yeah. And you show up and they read, during the worship, they read this letter to the Hebrews. Yeah. And things start to click in your head. And I think that's really a, so Jews in that period would have been asking themselves, what, what are we doing here? Yeah. You know, what's our purpose? And I think that's, we have to ask that individually as Christians. First sermon I ever preached in this church, actually, that was the first, why are you here? Yeah. And uh, we have to ask ourselves that as individuals, why do I show up here every week? Yeah. And, and sit in these hard benches 
yeah. and listen to a guy like Anar Ram talk to me for 45 minutes <laughs> out of a book that's 2,000 plus years old. Yeah. And then we have to answer that as a congregation. We have to answer that as a denomination. Yeah. And then uh, uh, across Christianity more broadly, we have to yeah. be able to answer that question. You yeah. know? And some of us, you know, it's to feed the poor and yep. visit the sick. And that's perfectly oh, that's legitimate. Very legitimate. But if, you're, if, you're, if your whole purpose for existence is limited to those two things, church is going to become quickly irrelevant because there's a lot of people visiting the sick and yeah. feeding the poor, you know? So... Yeah. These are all legitimate questions. I don't think it's a departure at all. It's, yeah. you know, you, again, put it into this continuity picture. picture. Yep. What are we doing here? Yep. And our purpose isn't, and that's the thing. We, I come back to that word balance. We need balance. Our, our message isn't the health message. That's part of it. Our message isn't keeping the seventh day Sabbath. That's part of it. But the key is, is to keep the big picture. This is about Jesus. Right. And that's, that's the key. It's about Jesus. So let's, let's, before time, we have about 30 minutes. I want to really di- sort of dissect Hebrews 1. And, and uh, let me read 1 through 4 out of the NIV. In the past, God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways. But in these last days, he has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, through whom he made the universe. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being, sustaining all things by his powerful word. After he had uh, provided purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty in heaven, so he became as much superior to the angels as the name he has inherited is superior to theirs. Wow. So, God has spoken to our forefathers. Remember that text? I can't remember what, exactly where it's found, but God does nothing without first revealing his plans to his prophets. So God spoke to his pro- through his prophets. And now he shows up in person. What difference does that make, Roger? What difference does it make that Jesus actually came to this place we call earth? What difference does it make? Carlos, yes. God wasn't the mark, acted on, followed up on, yep. promised, planned, and was made before we were even created. So it says that God is a God of promises and commitments. Yeah. So it wasn't just talk. I think that's a very good point. Very valid. Anybody else? We should come to the conclusion like King Solomon. He said the whole conclusion is to fear God. Fear God and give glory. Yes. Because he was a king. He was powerful. One of the greatest kings that ever lived. He had all the wisdom. And yet, he had to answer the very questions that we have to answer. And the conclusion he came to is to give God all the glory. <laughs> it's a very good point, Mary. And I think that's important because remember how he indulged himself in anything he wanted. He, he, spared, he spared nothing. Good and the bad. <clears throat> yep. And, and you know, on that note... His, I would probably have to say his greatest accomplishment, of course, was building the temple. David wasn't allowed it. And, I mean, physical, you know. He had all these possessions. But at the end of the day, the legacy he leaves behind is his temple. So, but thank you, Mary. That's a good point. And another point, too, after he had come to his senses and realized that God is God, he asked the Lord that if his people would be anyway and they turned towards the temple to give praise. He asked the Lord to answer to the prayer. I think that was very touching. Thank you. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else, what difference does it make 
that God actually came here. To me, it also says he's a relatable God. He knows what it's like. And going on what Carlos was saying, it wasn't just talk. He actually came. And that's, that's you know, and, and, yeah. And I think this is where it comes down to very practical stuff, where we have to say, okay, Lord, help. It's like a prayer we often pray. May others see you through me. Precisely. Yeah. And that was, that's ultimately Jesus purpose again you know it's um historical context faction different groups a lot of things are open to interpretation right god might not be all talk but we all too often are yeah and so we could sit and come you know there's whatever 15 of us here or whatever we can come up with 15 different ideas then we can start to argue over whose idea is better <laughs> and that's sort of the environment that you have in first century palestine yeah right and then it only gets worse once the church comes into being because now you just go through paul's letters and it's like every church he's like hey, yep. you got this heresy you got that heresy you know like and the seven churches in Revelation is only one that has nothing wrong with it. Right. Yeah. So yeah. you have Jesus come along, and it's almost like Jesus becomes... Car Karl Barth, actually, a uh, Swiss theologian, middle of the 20th century, he developed this, this word-focused... I forget his term for it. It was in German, of course, and I don't yep. know German, but I forget his exact term for it. Um, but he came up with this word-focused theology, right? And when he s s used the word word, he meant it in two different ways. Obviously, we have the word, right? Yep. And historically speaking, Protestants especially, were very much focused on this. Yep, so if it's not sure. in here, yep. then I don't believe it, which is a perfectly good yep. uh, foundational yep. doctrine to have. But then what Bart was kind of focusing people on, sometimes a little too an extreme, to the exclusion of Scripture, but he's saying, what does Scripture reveal to us? Scripture reveals to us the Word, capital yeah. W, Jesus. That becomes our ultimate interpretive lens for the world, for our own behavior, for the purpose of the church. So instead of, you know, I think all too often, I think he has a valid point that all too often we'll take the Scriptures, and that's what, that's what his, some of his disciples were guilty of this. You take the Scriptures and you say, we know the Scriptures apply to you, Master, so you have to fit into this box yeah. that we've created for you out of the scriptures. And Jesus is like, no, 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 no. There are no boxes here. I created the boxes. I don't get yeah. put in them. <laughs> right? And so now instead of you kind of flip it, now we need to read scripture through the lens of Jesus. What, is, what has Jesus revealed about the character and purposes of God? And how does that affect how we see everything else? So you can take that too far because then you can say, well, Jesus was whatever, he, I put him in this box that I've created, and now I interpret Scripture through that. So you have to be careful, but I think it's a valid point. He is the ultimate revelation of God's character. And that's where I think we can be, quote, Christian, but still fall for the sin of idolatry, in the sense that oh, yeah. we have this preconceived idea about who God is, and we keep him on a shelf. But if we really let Jesus loose... He will change our lives to the point that it brings us into some scary stuff. And today I'm preaching on reconciliation. You know, that's a scary thing. Reconciliation? It's easier to not reconcile. Pretend a problem doesn't exist. It'll go away. That's our, you know, that's really our, our, our often our true way of approaching a problem. Right. Pretend it's not there, it'll go away. And often I think, right, when we, when we take Scripture, we take Christianity... We take it and we use it to focus outward. Yeah. Right? I saw I saw Anar at the supermarket the other day and he was doing whatever that was just viciously out of character and a sin, you know. Oh, I, I think you're gonna like, talk about the pork that was in my shop. Yeah, cart. whatever. Yeah. He had pork chops <laughs> in a shopping cart and then I saw him sneak into the liquor store. Oh after yeah. And, I thought no. You know I, what I mean? So that was you. <laughs> oh you're you're from Europe though. You guys are liberals. That's right, that's <laughs> right. <laughs> but you know, that's what we do though. We focus it outward. Yeah. 
you know, what's wrong with our culture? What's wrong with my neighbor? Yeah. What's wrong with the guy sitting on the other side of the, ch- uh, of, of, of the church? What's wrong with this group? What's wrong with the Muslims? What's wrong with the Jews? What's wrong with the secularists? All this sort of stuff. Yeah. And ultimate reconciliation comes not when you say, well, I know you had pork chops in your sh- supermarket, but I forgive you. It's no, it's when you look into the face of Jesus yeah. and he reflects back to you your sin. Think of the woman at the well, yeah. right? How did she become convinced that he was the Messiah? When he looked directly at her and said, you say correctly that you have no husband because you've had four. And the one that you have now is not your husband. Yeah. He exposed her own character to herself and that's when she let it all go. It wasn't, well, Anar said he was sorry because he had pork chops in his car. Yeah. You know what I mean? And now I forgive him. No, I, had, I, I came to the realization that I needed forgiveness, not from you. Right. I might. Right. But ultimately, I need forgiveness from my creator. And that's, that's where the reconciliation comes. And that's, what, that's exactly what the Hebrews needed in the first. That's what the church in general, not just the Jewish Christians, but the whole church needed in the first century. And it's what the church needs now. I was just going to ask you, do we need it today? Well, we need it constantly. We need it. We're human beings. And that's where it's interesting when you look at, when you read the book of Acts and the, and the New Testament, it starts off so amazing. You know, with Acts two and three, and they're sharing their possessions. It's like it's like it's like uh, paradise on earth. So that's around thirty something A.D. You get to Corinth and other churches thirty years later. It's like a mess. It's a disaster. Not even thirty years later. And what happened? Why did things deteriorate so bad? And it's human nature. It's our failure to deal with ourselves. And here is this perfect situation, and we mess it up. Mm-hmm. And why do we mess it up? Because a lot of different things. Pride, insecurity, arrogance. We think it's, we, we know how it needs to be done. Well, there's nothing wrong with me. It's the problem's with you. I, I, I agree the problem is <laughs> You know? <laughs> yep. Um, and then, you know, we do that as individuals. Yep. As spouses, as parents, as friends, as neighbors, as members of the same church, and then yeah. we do it, you know, I mean, again, I don't want to sound judgmental like you said before, but in our denomination and then in the church, capital C, global Christian church, yeah. um, we do the same thing. You know, I just think of how off message, off message, so many of us are, yeah. and then we become combative. And then you say, well, I, I think you're off message. And I say, well, I know my message is right because, you know, here's my proof text or whatever. And then I become, and then my, my defense mechanism is to accuse you of, you know, I bec- you start to project. Yep. And then ultimately, when you said put God on a shelf, I think ultimately what we end up doing, and we often do it without realizing, is we project onto God. You know, oh, we, yeah. We turn God into an image of ourselves because... Otherwise, we get really uncomfortable. That Jesus that looks into our soul and exposes our own sin, we're not cool with that. It makes us feel really, really bad. That's true. Now, uh, someone just uh, texted in John 5, 39. And you diligently search the Scriptures because you think by them you possess eternal life. These are the Scriptures that testify about me yet you refused to come to me and have life, to have life. Very timely. Absolutely. And, and that's, that's a really, it's a balancing act, Roger. Which part? <laughs> the whole thing. The whole, like we, we just read from John 5. We can search the scriptures, but yet be totally lost. And... Don't search the scriptures. Right. That's the balancing act. Right. Search the scriptures, but the scriptures won't save us. No. Jesus will. And the only the, the scriptures are almost a tool to help us learn about Jesus or a vehicle toward Jesus, but that's it. That's it. We, we, we can easily fall into the trap of we search for the truth, we have the truth, we have the right interpretation of the scriptures, and boy, then you get stuck there, and that's not a good place to be stuck in. That becomes a form of idolatry in and of itself. That's a great yeah. point. You know, yeah. And you have to be, you can say 
we have the truth, or we search the Scriptures for the truth. And you could say that all day long, but are you really genuinely searching the Scriptures for truth? Because, right. And the ultimate test is when you, when you come to a truth in Scripture that indicts you. Mm. Do you skip over it and go to the pork chop section? <laughs> If you're, if, you're search, if you're searching the scriptures and you don't end up in a few texts that are the equivalent of Jesus and the woman at the well for you, then you're probably not searching. Yeah. Right. Because there are, mo there are spots in scripture that would point to me in the same way that Jesus pointed yeah. to the woman at the well. Yeah. yeah. And that's when you said about like people who go to church for different reasons, you know, a lot of us, obviously, you know, you, you, this, I think it's a, a big time, like, especially when I was a kid. Now I'm not so sure because these, these younger generation of adults is hard to figure out sometimes <laughs> about their motivations. Yeah. But when I was a kid, you know, you had, you could still say that we lived in a sort of Christian society, right. sort of, right? We were the, you know, you could, you could assume by default that your neighbor, uh, had some sort of Christian had some type. sort of idea yeah. of what it was all about. Yeah, and so you became this, you know, the whole seeker culture from the '70s to the '90s, and you know, you looked for a church that made me feel comfortable and good. Willow and, Creek stuff, yeah. Right, and you know, again, the balance, right? The balance is Nietzsche, Friedrich Nietzsche. That was one of his principal criticisms of Christianity: was it was a religion of weaklings, uh. you know humility it was a slave religion yeah and um romans thought the same thing yeah they did and you know you can you can go you have to balance you know yes i search the scriptures because i want the scriptures to indict me i want to be indicted i want to know what's wrong but at the same time i want the hope that in spite of what's wrong with me right that god takes care of the problem and, and, but i have to be willing to cooperate with him you know what i mean so Yes. Sorry. I no, that's perfect. Off, that's off we're getting we're getting we're getting personal rather than just academic, and that's that's the real purpose of Sabbath school Bible study to really get down to where the rubber meets the road. Mandy. Yeah, and I just wanted to piggyback on that in the sense of like when you do search the scriptures, are you searching it for heart knowledge or head knowledge? Yep. And I think like as I'm a newer SDA member, because um, I grew up Catholic, I never questioned any of it because I was just like. I was supposed to do and I sought God out in prayer and never told anybody and was like I want Bible study and I want nutrition information and I didn't tell anybody and I prayed from April all, all the way through diligently until December when he sent me a cold order yep. whom I didn't know anything yeah. about um, and so that's where that distinction came from was that I was seeking it out through heart knowledge like I yep. was literally going, God, I need the absolute truth. And I did. I really struggled with the seventh day Sabbath versus Sunday worship. And thankfully, God and I wrestled and thankfully he won, hands down. We're thankful and too. Here today, but um, I do think like, you're right, it's that balance and only God knows what your true seeking out of truth is, if it's head knowledge or heart knowledge. Because yeah. he's in charge of your knowledge, wisdom, and understanding yeah. of scripture. The Very distinction cool. I would make that from an apologetic, an academic apologetic point of view yeah. is the distinction you're making is the distinction between religion and worldview, yep. right? Mm. You can have a religion that says, you know, if you were baptized as an infant, I'm not criticizing Roman Catholicism here, I'm just making an observation, but, you know, you can have a religion that says, you know, if you, if, as long as you were baptized as an infant and you got confirmed when you were 12 and you come to church at least once a week and you eat the bread and you drink the wine yep. and you say the prayers and you do this and you do that, whatever, then you get this sort of like comfort, like I fulfilled my obligations, right? Yeah. That's religion. <clears throat> you can say the same, Islam, as long as you go to the mosque and you pray five yep. times a day and you face towards Mecca and all this kind of stuff, you're good. Everything's good, you know, and you get this comfort. It's almost like we turn ourselves into like this sort of like OCD spiritual yeah. person, right? As long as I went through, you know, as long as I touched the doorknob five times before I walked out, it's okay. Whatever. We, we, can, we can do that with religion. Yeah. Worldview says, what's the fundamental nature of reality? Mm -hmm. Right? How do I view the world? Literally, yep. how do I view the world? How do I, yep. And how does that affect my behavior? How does that affect how I treat other people? How does that affect how I do my job at work? How I treat my children? How I treat my spouse? How 
I treat my neighbor, the stranger, so on and so forth, that those are fundamental differences because I can go and I can eat the wafer and drink the wine or pray five times yeah. towards Mecca. Or in the Jewish context for Hebrews, I can go to the temple, slit yeah. the throat of a lamb and walk out. Yep. And then I can go and cheat my customer out of money or yep. engage in criminal activity or commit yep. adultery or whatever the case may be. My worldview hasn't changed. Yep. Right? I, still, I'm, I still have a sinful worldview yep. versus a, a redeemed, reformed worldview. Yep. So... So, Maybe that's off topic too. No, but it's coming back to that old song, it's me, it's me, it's me, O oh Lord, standing in need of prayer. And, you know, we say this cliche, but it, we really need to say it. You know what? I have a lot of growing to do. And I need other people to help me. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And not just say it off cliche, oh, I'm not perfect, and nobody's perfect. But say, you know what? I really want to get ready for Jesus. I really want to be, I want my character to be right, you know, but it's not about me. That's the thing. That's, that's a fine balance. We can get obsessed about, like I say, sin management. It's not about that. But we need to say, have the right, the right view of the world, of the Lord, of ourselves, and, and somehow have the right environment where we are actually growing and developing spiritually. Well, it's, I mean, it's maturing. It's, I don't know, the way I put it to people, like I have a lot of conversations at work because until I had the job that I have now, I never realized how many non-Christians there were in the world. Oh, wow. And <laughs> I mean, I, come on, I grew up in an yeah. Adventist home and went to college at Southern. I met my wife and I moved to Lancaster. <laughs> ABC was still open. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, you know, yeah. I didn't realize. And uh, one reason why I studied what I studied at seminary, but, um, you know, I have, a lot of conversations with folks and when they question you know you have people question like well you're a smart guy blah 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 sophisticated you read a lot of books how you know why do you believe you know it's like believing in santa claus or the easter yeah. bunny or something how they would see it yeah right you yeah. know or what's the purpose you know i mean i can see i could see you know why it makes you feel better or maybe why you want to do it it gives you this system by which to organize your life and the way I like to explain, one way that I like to explain it to people is that you can convince yourself of anything, right? Mm -hmm. we, we have entire academic institutions that are dedicated to convincing themselves and yep. the rest of the world that we can construct reality using words and ideas and yep. all these sorts of things. But eventually reality is a brick wall, right? So you can convince it, you know, you can, you can idealize yourself a thousand miles away from the brick wall and then start running full speed ahead, convinced that the brick wall doesn't, isn't there. But eventually you're going to run into that brick wall. Yep. Or you can walk into a room and every time you walk into a room, there's a guy standing there, he's punch you right in the nose. Yeah. And so you leave and the next day you go, maybe this time he won't be there. That was yesterday, now it's today. And you open the door and you walk through the door, the guy punches you in the nose. Yep. How many times are you going to walk through the door and get punched in the nose before you say, maybe I should try another door? Yeah. Right? It's ad fundamentally adapting yourself to just the way the universe actually is. And I wrote down actually uh, on Tuesday at the end, it says, why is it such great news that Jesus reveals the character and the glory of the Father to us? What does Jesus tell us about what the Father is like? I mean, you can answer that in a lot of ways, but the thing that came to my mind was the C.S. Lewis quote, I believe in Christianity as I believe in the sun. Mm -hmm. Not so much because I've seen it risen, but, and I'm paraphrasing here, but when it's risen, I can see everything else, right? Mm -hmm. there's, there's, there's the difference. I don't believe that the sun is there. It's not just that the sun's there because I can see it rise, a ball of fire in the sky, but because it illuminates. Yep. It provides heat and warmth and life, you know? So... Again, I could convince myself. So, you know, when you, when you were sharing outside. that, the two-word phrase came into my mind, reality check. That's ultimately what Christianity is. Yeah. Hey, you should have taken, you know, you should have drank a V8. Yeah. Yeah, hey, you should, you should have tried to yeah. adapt your life to the way the world really works. And the only person that knows how the world really works is the person that created the world. Yeah. And so you seek that, and that's what it means ultimately to find truth, right? Are you, are you searching the scriptures in order to understand God's purpose for this world that he created? 
And if you're legitimately doing that, we can have disagreements, we can have different angles, points of yeah. view. You know, I, we've had conversations like this before. Yeah. I mean, you can come in and say, hey, it's all about going out on the street and passing out tracks about Daniel and Revelation. And I can say, well, no, it's all about going to the soup kitchen and making sure that people have a warm place to sleep at night. Yeah. Well, it's about all those things. Yeah. And maybe that's what your purpose is. Yeah. And ultimately, as long as we're both directed towards the goal yeah. of Christ, or actually, it's more like we're all, if, as long as we gather around Christ, as Christ is the center of the circle yeah. we form, and we're looking towards him, we all start walking straight ahead. Eventually, we all wind up in the same place. Yeah. Right? And that's not meant to sound like some sort of like universalist ecumenicalism no, 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 or anything. I know. But that's, that's really the goal. And we get so, I don't know, we just get so convinced that we're right. Yeah. None of us are right. Right. By ourselves, yeah. I think we are the body of Christ. Well, yeah, that's what yeah. the Bible says, yeah. and I believe the Bible. Yeah. So. No, I know, but what I'm saying is that together we have something to offer each other. We're symbiotic. Oh, yeah. You know, and that's how we, we achieve. We don't achieve perfection, but we're, we're getting on that way. You know, the lone Christian, the lone, the lone uh, ranger Christian ideas, that's not going to work. Right. We need each other. And I'm convinced, and this might be really off topic, but maybe not. I'm convinced that really that's, especially the Seventh-day Adventist denomination, because of our history and our makeup and our ideas. I'm convinced that Christianity, the church is, I mean, one of the most awesome and unexploited opportunities for the church in today's world is showing how people focused on similar goals coming at it from different directions in the same group. We're not ideologically uniform, right? but we're unified in love. And I think that's really the greatest witness the church has in today's environment. Yep. Because families are falling apart, friendships are ending because you read the wrong book, you voted for the wrong person, you said the wrong thing, you believed the wrong thing, whatever. And it's really sad. Yeah. And, you know, it, there's a risk in the church, too, that we can allow that to seep in here. And as long as, but I think as long as we stay focused on Jesus. Yeah. And that's ultimately the message of Hebrews. That's Hebrews chapter one. Hey, yeah. God has revealed himself in his son. Yeah. You know, everything else is secondary. Yeah. And, and I think... I'm going to use this metaphor, a laboratory, in a way, this is a laboratory mm -hmm. where we're trying out things, we're exploring ideas, and, and, and both intellectually and experientially. And it comes back to, like the phrase again, reality check. I may say, you know what, I'm a pretty nice guy, but all of Clinton is saying, man, that ain't our Rom guy, he is a mean guy. And I need somebody to say, you know what, Aino, you may think you're a nice guy, but that's not what's coming across. And do I have the right humility to say, oh, I didn't know this. This is a, you know, tell me more. And then it comes out and, and then I can grow. It's when we face reality that we can, that things begin to change. So I see Donnie showing up with a yellow card and it says, we have 10 minutes, 10 minutes, I see. So, but, um, you need to get new contacts. Yeah, I think <laughs> that was a good one. <laughs> so, um, any closing thoughts or comments? Continue through. If you don't have your quarterly, I checked this out. Basically, this was focus was Hebrew one. Next week it's Hebrews two. So if you, if you don't have your quarterly, just want to take 10 minutes before Sabbath school, just read Hebrews 2 next week, and then Hebrews 3. It seems to follow that pattern. I didn't check the whole quarter, but at least for the next couple of weeks. So just take that to kind of Look, marinate on we've that. We've been doing this almost two years, and I, I think it's okay for me to admit this at this point. I've shown up a time or two without having studied ahead of time, so, and I still talk. You just <laughs> So if any of you guys want to show up without studying and talk. Yeah. Yep. So. Cool. <laughs> That's the humility, right? That's, That's the humility. <laughs> so... <laughs> so. Well, listen, why don't we have prayer and let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this discussion. Lord, again, it comes down to how does this impact our lives? And Lord, we thank you for the fact that you've, you have impacted our lives. Perhaps it was 
this week, maybe it was decades ago, but Lord, I pray that that connection will be fresh and that we will be, as the Bible says, be transformed from glory to glory, from glory to glory, day by day. And I pray that that glory isn't about us, it's about you, about the amazing condescension, it's amazing about the, the incarnation, the, the sacrifice, the resurrection, glorification, all that's happening or has happened and is happening through you. And thank you for the fact that it comes down to us trusting in you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.